Hey guys, welcome in. This is Pastor Jeff coming to you from my podcast studio. You have clicked on Unshakable, and I appreciate you being with me here today. We are continuing to talk about the war in Israel in our series titled Defending the Land. But today, I want to take a little deviation from the path we've been walking down in recent episodes. Today, I'd like to talk about the ideological concept of Zionism. Essentially, what I want to do is sort of walk you through some of the important events in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that have sadly brought us to the point where we're at today. Now, back in my day, back in the dark ages of the 1970s and 80s, the history of this region where the conflict is happening and the issues on both sides, Israeli and Palestinian, were pretty well known by much of the American public because we saw it every single night. We saw it in our newspapers. Uh, We saw it on our TV screens on the nightly news. And of course, back in the day, the news media was much less partisan and more honest and straightforward about the facts. So we sort of knew to some extent what was happening in that part of the world. But today, it seems to me as I look out at the landscape that much of the public has no clue about the historical background of this conflict. All they know is what's happening right now, what they see on social media, you know, they see posts on TikTok, And they're simply regurgitating the propaganda that's being fed to them. And I think it's that level of ignorance about the history that is driving so much of the foolishness that you see on university campuses and in street protests that are taking place all over the world. So the goal of today, for those who have clicked in and maybe you're interested in knowing more about the history of the conflict, let's see if we can set the record straight. Um, because I think that's important for us to talk about the truth about the history so that we can properly analyze what's happening in the land today. So let's start with this concept of Zionism. Now that, that concept is being talked about a lot these days, most of it in a pejorative sense. Uh, it's become quite controversial and, and it's become offensive to many. If you just go to a public place in many parts of America and say, I'm a Zionist out loud, you're likely to be attacked, if not physically, at least verbally. And part of the reason for the controversy and for the confusion is that people are talking past each other because they're not using the same definition of that word. So let's talk about what does Zionism actually mean? Here's the simplest definition that I can come up with. It goes as follows. Zionism is a nationalist movement that advocates for Jewish self-determination and a Jewish homeland in the biblical land of Israel. That's it. It's really not that complicated. The problem is that that simple definition over the years has been latched onto by various political groups on both sides of the conflict and expanded to mean other things than what it was originally intended to refer to. And by the way, even with those who would call themselves Zionists today, there is a range of opinions and positions about the nature of the Israeli state and how to deal with the ongoing Palestinian problem. For example, on the Israeli left, there are many in the land, even today, who advocate for full citizenship rights for all Palestinians, breaking down all walls between the two peoples. In the middle, there are those who advocate for what we call the two-state solution, meaning two separate nations, Israel and Palestine, who recognize each other as sovereign states and attempt to live in peaceful cooperation. And then on the Israeli right, which is a growing number because of the attack on October 7th, there are those who believe that a sovereign Palestinian state anywhere west of the Jordan River is just unacceptable because it's automatically a security threat. So there's all these positions among Zionists, but the one thing that they all agree on and all share left, right, and center is the fundamental right for Israel to exist in the land. And until the Palestinians and the surrounding Muslim countries acknowledge that fact, that they do have the right to exist there, there really is no path forward to peace. Now, one last thing I'll mention about Zionism before we get into the history, and that is is something that gets sort of confused in all of the rhetoric. Being a Zionist does not mean that you automatically approve of everything that Israel as a government does. You can be fully in favor of Jewish self-determination and a Jewish homeland, and I am, by the way, but at the same time criticize policies of the Israeli government, which I've done in the past. It doesn't make you anti-Zionist or anti-Semitic to criticize the Israeli government any more 
then it would, if you criticized our government, that that would make you anti-American. So sometimes those things get patched together, but they don't need to be. You can be critical of Israel as a country. So let's talk now about the past history of the Zionist movement and ask the question, how did the modern state of Israel come about? Well, Zionism emerged in the late 1800s. It, a lot of people tend to think it's a rel relatively recent thing, but no, we're talking about the late 1800s. And it came about as a response to a long, long history of anti-Semitic persecution aimed at Jewish communities all across the world, primarily in, in Europe, Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, and also in North Africa. And when I talk about anti-Semitic persecution, I'm not talking about just threats of violence as we see today in the West. I'm talking about actual violence, actual pogroms where Jews who are routinely either murdered or driven out of countries by native populations. It really, it's an amazing and very sad thing to examine. The Jewish people have this extensive history of being scattered into foreign nations all over the world and then as they try to create community for themselves, struggling to be accepted. And by the late 1800s, Jewish leaders had come to the conclusion that the only way they would ever be able to live in peace and security would be if they could have their own homeland, a place where they could be the majority and not a persecuted minority. And so they began to advocate for a return to their historical indigenous land marked out in the Bible as this nation we call Israel and Judah, uh, a, a, a boundary that dates all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and later to the great kingdoms of David and Solomon. They also spoke about the excitement of a cultural and national renaissance movement among the Jewish people, if they could just get to a homeland. They talked about reviving the native Hebrew language, reestablishing their culture and traditions, being able to, to worship God freely. These were exciting things for Jews at this time in history. So there were some religious underp underpinnings to the movement. They talked about you know, returning to the Torah, returning to the temple, to the prayers, to the Jewish calendar, uh, celebrating the high holidays in Jerusalem. Some rabbis even argued that a Jewish settlement in Israel would set the stage for the coming of Messiah. But that type of religious Zionism was far and away a minority opinion. This is an important thing to understand. Religious Zionism was secondary to what we call political Zionism. Political Zionism was driven by secular Jews who were simply laser focused on estab establishing a nation state in the land. That was the primary goal. So then how did the migration to the land begin? Well, the biblical land of Israel, remember, was conquered by the Ottoman Turks in the year 1517. And the Turks maintained control over what we call Israel today for the next 400 years. It wasn't until the end of World War I in 1917 that the power of the Ottomans began to fade from world history. And that transition of power from the Ottomans to European nations like Great Britain and France gave the Zionist movement a chance to gain steam and to begin this migrating process back into the land. So between the years 1882 and 1903, around 25,000 Jews moved back into the region, purchasing land as they arrived. And that's an important point because sometimes the accusation is made that the Jews stole the land, but the Jews in the early Zionist movement purchased land when they came back to Israel. And those 25,000 Jews that moved during that time at the turn of that century essentially doubled the Jewish presence that was in the land at that time. Now, most of that migration was from Eastern European countries, places like Russia and Poland, but soon Jews from other Middle Eastern countries who were suffering under a Muslim majority rule, they too began to migrate towards the land from places like Yemen and Morocco and Iraq and Turkey. Now, following World War I and the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, the League of Nations, which was the forerunner to the UN, gave control over those biblical lands to Great Britain. Okay, so Great Britain received, uh, at, they call, we call it the British Mandate, an assignment from the United Nations to manage the biblical land of what we call Israel today. That was handed to Great Britain. But what the Brits learned over the next 20 years or so was this mandate was not really a blessing. What they gained was a very messy and complex situation with no easy solutions. Their presence in the land was resented 
by both sides of the conflict. The Jews resented their presence, the Arabs resented their presence, and British soldiers often found themselves under attack from terrorists on both sides. Nobody was happy with having Europeans determine the future of two people groups who both claimed ownership to the land. So, the Brits formed a task force in 1937 called the Peel Commission to look for a solution that would allow them to pull out of the region and hand the land off to these two people groups. And they concluded it made the most sense to create two independent states, one for the Jews and one for the Arabs. And that became known, and this is still a phrase that's being used today, it became known as the two-state solution. And friends, this is the first in a series of moments when the concept of an Arab state, or if you prefer, a Palestinian state, was offered but foolishly rejected by the Arab side. There's a whole bunch of offers in history that have been made to the Palestinians to have their own state, and time and time again, they rejected it. That's, that's just a fact of history you have to know. Now, the Peel Commission suggested a split that was actually heavily in favor of the Arabs. The British offered them 80% of the territory under their mandate. They were given all of Judea and Samaria, all of the Negev in the south, while the Jews would receive about 20% of the land, Galilee and the northern coastline. And the Jews, who were just anxious for anything, anxious for recognition, they voted to accept the deal, but the Arabs said no. They didn't want that. They would not share the land. And so they went back to resisting the Brits using violent tactics to try to force them out of the region. Well, soon after that, World War II broke out, and over the next 10 years, it was the atrocities of the Nazis and the Holocaust that solidified Zionism as a global movement. And Jews from all over the world began fleeing to the land, which they viewed as a safe place finally to put down some roots. And over those 10 years, listen to the numbers here. The Jewish population that was about 50,000 in the early 1900s grew to an estimated 650,000. And in response, uh, Muslims seeing what was going on, more and more Arabs also began moving into the region from surrounding Muslim nations. And it became sort of an arms race to see who could occupy more of the space. And the outline of the conflict became apparent to all. Both sides were going to try to move as many people in as possible and then claim that they own the land. Now, in 1947, the year before Israel became an official nation state, the British, who were tired of this entire project and then were ready to hand it off and just withdraw, asked the United Nations to step in and find a solution to the tensions. And like the Peel Commission, the UN decided that the best way to resolve this conflict was to divide the land into two separate states. And in November 1947, the UN voted on what we call a partition plan to create a Jewish state and an Arab state. Now, they drew up the map slightly differently than the Peel Commission had, but still the Arabs were given the majority of the land and some of the best parts of the land. The Arabs were offered all of Judea and Samaria, the southern coastline, and a portion of western Galilee. The Jews were given the entire Negev, which, as you might know, is all desert and not, not the most accommodating part of the country, but a big chunk of land, plus eastern Galilee and the northern coastline. Again, the Jews accepted the offer. And again, the Arabs rejected it. All of the surrounding Muslim nations voted against the United Nations resolution and said, we will go to war to prevent it from being implemented. So in 1948, with negotiations, negotiations going nowhere and the official end of the British mandate coming up, the head of Israel's Zionist movement, a national hero by the name of David Ben-Gurion, declared to the world that the modern state of Israel had been established. That's what they've always, the entire, the entire purpose of the Zionist movement in 1948 was established. Israel was a nation. And the Muslim states around it responded by doing exactly what they had promised to do. And war was now happening. Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria all combined launched an all-out war against the Jews from every side. Now, this is where things get controversial and where the pop propaganda really begins to fly. With the outbreak of what we call the Arab-Israeli War, 
hundreds of thousands of Palestinians immediately fled the war zone to get out of harm's way. And they were advised to do that by these Muslim countries. Get out of the way because we're coming in to drive the Jews out. They were advised to get up and, and, and uproot their families and leave the area with the promise that once the war was over and they had won and that they had driven the Jews out, they could return. Big problem. The Muslims didn't win the war and the Jews weren't driven out of the land. Israel was successful in repelling this invasion. And now a massive refugee problem had been created because all of these, all these Palestinians had got up and moved. They'd been uprooted by the war and they were scattered all over the Middle East. Not Israel's fault, by the way, right? They were displaced by the decision on the part of these surrounding Muslim nations to invade. But this is what's known among the Arab world as the Nakba. Now, you may have heard that term being thrown around recently. It's a favorite propaganda tool. Nakba is the Arabic word that translates in English to catastrophe. And in their minds, it's the moment the Palestinians say they lost any chance of having their own independent nation. But again, the reason behind the Nakba wasn't Israel's fault. Israel fought a defensive war in 1948. But the Nakba has become an empathy card that Palestinians will play in their propaganda efforts to paint Israel as a colonizer of the land. But as I said in the last episode, wars have consequences. If you invade a nation and you lose, there are going to be ramifications of that. And by refusing the offer of the Peel Commission in 1937, the offer of the UN in 1947, and then choosing war, the Palestinian people were then left without a homeland. Now, side note, although a huge number of Arabs vacated the land because of the conflict, many stayed. And those who stayed and committed themselves to peace, ultimately were given Israeli citizenship. And today, I mentioned this in a previous podcast, today about 20% of Israel's citizenry is made up of Arabs who have full rights as citizens. They live peaceably as a part of Israel, and they love Israel as a result. By the way, going back to Israel's war for independence in 1948, Let's, let's make sure we say this as well. It's nothing short of a miracle that the Jews came out on top of this war after eight months of fighting. I find it hard to imagine that without God's sovereign protection that a brand new, yet-to-be-organized nation like Israel could defeat the combined efforts of five established Muslim nations and their armies. Right? It's amazing. Because these Muslim nations, they had standing armies and Israel was just getting, you know, kicking off their, their brand new country and, and they, they get invaded from every possible angle, angle and, the, and the Jews are able to repel them. How is that not divine protection? And what were the results of this victory? Not only did the Jews push the invaders back, they actually cap, captured territory beyond what had been offered to them in the UN partition plan. They gained all of the Galilee and slightly more land in Judea and Samaria. And then by agreement with the UN, Israel allowed Jordan to receive back the territory that we call today the West Bank and allowed Egypt to receive back what we call the Gaza Strip today, which was contiguous to their land in the Sinai Peninsula. And that was a concession on the part of Israel in order to try to, to come to a peaceful resolution and to end that war. Because listen, Israel didn't want war. They just wanted to settle down in, in a place of security and peace. And that's where things would stand until 1967, which I'll get to in our next podcast because we're running late on time. But one last note, something that often gets overlooked in the historical discussion. While it's true that some 700,000 Palestinians were uprooted by the 1948 war in the Nakba. And by the way, without hesitation, we can say that that situation was tragic for just common, innocent you know, Palestinians who got caught up in that political chess match and became permanent refugees because of the war. We should, as Christians, be able to empathize with that. That's tragic. But there's another side to the story as well. After 1948, with, with religious tensions rising all over the Middle East and in Africa, Many Jews also were forced out of Muslim lands. So there was a Nakba on the Jewish side as well. Estimates are that some 900,000 Jews became refugees after 1948, having to migrate out of Muslim countries. 
The majority of them came to Israel for relief. The rest of them ended up in various European countries. And by the way, you only need to look at statistics today to see that 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 hatred of Jews throughout the Middle East is still prevalent. While there are hundreds of thousands of Arabs living in Israel, let me say that again, while there are hundreds of thousands of Arabs living in Israel, in Egypt today, for example, there are less than 100 Jews. In Lebanon, less than 100 Jews. In Yemen, 50. In Syria, less than 100 Jews. In Libya, zero. In Jordan, zero Jews. Why is that? Well, because they're not welcome. They would be subject to violence. And so they had to leave. This is an uncomfortable fact that needs to be acknowledged. If we're going to acknowledge the Nakba on the Palestinian side, we should also recognize the fact that Jews have suffered in this conflict as well, having to be to basically force migrated out of Muslim lands where they were their families were rooted. So listen, this is a this is a messy situation. It's complex for sure. But I'm going to leave it here today at 1948 and we'll get to Boy, the next big step is 1967 and the Six-Day War. But this is enough for today. I hope this has been helpful, friends. In our next episode, we'll pick up with that major turning point in the history of the conflict. Until then, hey, pay attention to the news, guys. Listen carefully to what's happening out there, right? Stay focused. Love each other well. I'll talk to you soon.